Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this panel discussion, which is entitled Engaging Men, Critical Conversations About Masculinity and Sexual Violence Prevention. My name is Robert Barron. I am the Managing Director at the New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I have been with the organization for over seven years now. Uh, I am a white, light-skinned man. I have uh, short, dark hair. I'm wearing glasses. I have facial hair. And behind me is a background that includes a white doorway and a sign with images uh, associated with New Jersey Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I am joined today by three brilliant panelists uh, to have this conversation. Uh, first, I'm joined by Will Du Bois. Uh, Will is currently the prevention manager at the New Jersey Coalition to End Domestic Violence and has worked in the domestic violence field for nearly 20 years, providing batters intervention services. Will also served as an appointee to the New Jersey Domestic Violence Fatality and Near Fatality Review Board and was a member of NJCDB's Batters Intervention Program Standards Committee. Will, would you like to say hi to the audience? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be in the space with these, my, uh, with my other panelists and I'm um, looking forward to this conversation. Um, just a little bit about my surroundings. I am a light-skinned African-American male. Um, I am sitting in a room with a, uh, a brick wall behind me that is shaded gray, and I am wearing a uh, light blue shirt. Thank you, Will. Next, I'd like to introduce Jesse Mailer. Jesse is a senior program specialist on the public education campaign and programs team at Futures Without Violence, a national health and social organization dedicated to ending and preventing gender-based violence. At Futures, Jesse advances national violence prevention campaigns that engage youth, men, and boys, educators, and athletic coaches. Jesse, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure thing. It's uh, it's great to be here. Um, so excited to have this conversation today. And uh, yeah, visually, um, I'm a, a light-skinned, white, uh, man with uh, I have a green futures without violence background and a dark blue uh, turtleneck on today with some California sun glistening off of my face right now. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you, Jesse. Love it. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, our colleague Jeffrey Anthony. Jeffrey W. Anthony is a certified health education specialist focusing on human sexuality education and having worked in and around sexuality education for over a decade. Currently, they specialize in sexual violence survivor support, integrating trauma-informed approaches into practice and community support. Jeffrey, feel free to say hi to the crowd. Hey, everyone. Uh, Jeff or Jeffrey. Um, I use pronouns of the he and they series. I am a white Caucasian non-binary male. I am uh, sitting in my little book nook corner in my favorite wingback chair. I am joined by my calico cat. I have uh, some facial hair, a fresh fade. So, hello. Thank you, Jeffrey. So as we kick off and discuss the, the role of masculinity, the, the impact of masculinity as we talk about gender-based violence uh, and prevention efforts, um, very often when we discuss masculinity in this context, many will feel that we are rejecting the idea of masculinity outright. Um, instead of recognizing the distinction being drawn between constructive ideas of masculinity and some that are more harmful. So my first question to the panel is what does masculinity in its healthiest tradition and healthiest iteration look like? And how do we move towards that version of masculinity? I think that for me, the framing around healthy masculinity is something that has in some moments felt right and in some moments not felt right. Uh, in that, in a lot of communities that we work with across the country, you know, you you hear particularly men not not want not responding well to the framing around healthy masculinity, in part because I also I think it's always framed in opposition to toxic masculinity too. And I think that sometimes those things can be useful concepts to be thinking about harmful relationship behaviors, to be thinking about what inequity within a relationship looks like or what abusive or harmful norms we may have um, learned over time. But 
I think that it distracts from the core of what we're getting at, which is trying to really dig into all of the ways that uh, men and boys in our society have been taught from peers and family and media and school and all of these different sources that create just such a rigid frame about what it means to be a man. Um, a rigid frame around needing to be uh, a needing to be straight, about needing to be strong, about needing to be invulnerable. And when I think about, as you were sort of saying, like there's a push to reject or there's a fear of rejecting anything that is masculine, you know, I think about what does it just mean for through sifting through so many of our experiences, but I think we're going to talk more about our personal experiences and um, really dig into that through that, that introspection and reflection. How are we creating empathy? How are we creating deep understanding of our own emotions? How are we fostering a sense of responsibility amongst men to to play active roles to educating young people around issues of violence and abuse and about healthy relationships and how to show care for one another. So again, I think moving away from some of the language that that makes it that can sometimes I think make it feel seem, feel shaming or or judgmental if we have more we all have toxic elements that we've inter we, that we've internalized. We've all um I think a lot of it is contending with some of our our own challenges and harms that we've caused, if we move away from there just being the binary of what is healthy and toxic, I think it allows us to be in more healthy relationship with ourselves um, and looking at what we're actually looking to do, which is not to discard parts of ourselves, but to see ourselves more fully. I, I want to jump off some of what Jesse said there. Um, one of the thoughts, it's so like when I do sex education and someone comes up to me and they're like, I'm this identity and it is a identity that's new to me. My first response is, that's awesome. Tell me what it means to you. And so I also wanna take a step back and look at masculinity and say, why do we have to define it ourselves? Um, and, and really kind of focus back on the self. I think that's where Jesse was going a little bit, like how are we defining it for ourselves? Um, because I think that's also part of the issue is that we're trying to take a framework that has existed, that has been constructed by society and force that and like, how do we make this healthy? And maybe it's that, that that whole framework is just not gonna work in that way. We can't rework it. Um, and really, because in one of the, the programs that I facilitate for uh, teachers on how to work with young people, and it's like, the question is, how does your bias impact yourself. Well, my bias doesn't impact anything. Well, that's, that's, the, so in masculinity it comes back into, it's more about identifying how these things show up and how you respond to them. And so I think in its healthiest form, masculinity is however you want to express that form of masculinity, be clothing or things like that. But how do you hold yourself accountable to, to yourself? How do you, um, prioritize your emotional well-being without the sacrifice of others um, and learning how to create space between people. I think it is about how do we prioritize our emotional needs and not be afraid to ask for them. Um, for example, recently I met a friend um, and I was having a moment and he's a straight man and he just came up, gave me a hug and like kissed me on the cheek and told me it was going to be okay. So the ability to express without fear of what other people are going to do. And some of this is um, individual work and some of this is community work. I love what each one of you said. And, and you know, particularly um, one thing that I wanted to just uh, make note of that, uh, that Jeff mentioned was about making space. And I think that that's, uh, I think that that's the, one of the keys is that, you know, when, uh, you know, we're, we're talking with three uh, three men on this on this panel here um, who have been uh, socialized pretty much the same way, even though we 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 don't know each other from a can of paint, um, as they say, uh, we didn't grow up with each other. But, um, you know, I, I guarantee you there's certain slogans or certain statements that we could probably throw out that each one of us has heard on how we needed to respond to situations or 
because we were all socialized this uh, very much the same way. And I think that wherein lies the problem um, of having it in its healthiest form. I think that there's great things about being a man. I think that there's, um, you know, there's, there's certainly amazing things that are taught. Um, but I think what happens is, is where the, the rigid notions come in. I think that's where the, that's where the real issue um, in lies. And, and I think that those rigid notions really lend to, to violence um, towards women and just violence in, just, in general. Um, because even if we take it off of violence towards women, um, and we just say violence within our own gender. I mean, there's um, there's the uh, the person who is raised to be in in touch with their feelings and their emotions, which is not a very masculine thing to to be in 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 connection with. Um, you're supposed to be disconnected from those things. And so when you have a, you have a um, a young boy who's who's able to display those type of feelings at that age. He's challenged. He's he's ridiculed. He's often alienated. Um, often made to feel as though um, what he has, what he's displaying, is is inappropriate. That he's wrong, and that um, he needs to only have two words, either angry or, or happy, um, you know, in his vocabulary of emotional vocabulary. So, I think for me, um, you know, just echoing what the what the what you know my other uh, partners have said is that. You know, it's just one of those things where the healthiest way would be for people, for, for men to be able to express their feelings um, to, without fear or, or um, you know, apprehension of being ridiculed or feeling some type of shame. Um, I think that, um, you know, I love the, the example, Jeff, that you gave about a heterosexual man coming to you and just, you know, giving you a kiss on the cheek and saying it, it's going to be okay. I mean, um, you know, in certain spaces, you know, men don't even tell each other that they love them. I'm mean, talking brothers and family, but I, I think it, it's, I think because we have all these, these ideas around what that's supposed to look like and equating it to femininity that um, even men who are in touch with those feelings don't show them because it's, it's considered to be, um, it, it's considered to be unacceptable. So I think for me, the healthy for for me the healthiest way would just be for, um, once again, and I don't mean to be redundant, but just for just for people to be able to have for men to be able to have freedom, just to be able to be free to express yourself, and um, and have you know other men em embrace it because they learned how to be free to express themselves as well too. And I have a quick follow up to say it is also not the absence of harmful thoughts or think like we exist in community with each other. We're always in a process. We will invariably hurt people we care very deeply about. Not the absence of screwing up. It is not the absence of not naming something correctly. It's not the absence of having intense emotions or knowing how to always regulate yourself perfectly. And it's not about perfection. It's about how do we move forward when we do cross those lines. Right. Um, and really, I think it is the other part of it is that wraparound, that healthy piece is the accountability piece of when we screw up, because even it is unhealthy to expect perfection out of any gender identity or Absolutely. gender experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Robert, you asked the question, you know, well, how do we, and I know this part of the emphasis that we'll talk later about is, well, how do we how does this impact our, our, pro, our strategy, our programs, our education work? And I think just one thing to add right there is, you know, well, how do we break down this idea of healthy masculinity or healthy relationships into components that are more clear and simple? I mean, so much of this in my mind is about because of all of those social messages and those pressure, the peer pressures that Will was talking about, the things that put men and boys into these boxes through the fear of punishment um, and the fear of being ostracized and the fear of not feeling like enough and belonging is that we need, it's a practice. It's like any muscle that we're strengthening. We need to strengthen our active listening muscles to really be able to hear, to understand and not to respond or rebut. We need to be thinking about practicing the muscle of um, sharing and 
uh, equity in relationships, to have interdependence and support of friends and partners? How do we get better at asking questions? You know, not just saying, how are you, but why do, why do you feel that way? Or what experiences have brought you here? Um, to be thinking about, you know, to the point about accountability, the muscle of not needing to be asked four times to make a change that would really positively, if you're being asked to change a practice at home or a practice in a relationship or the way that we show up in arguments, if we're being asked to change and it's taking four or five reminders, we can do better than that. But that's a muscle. And that's not just, again, not to shame, but to say, this is something that is a practice. And I think that that's where so many of our, you know, our program programs and strategies are about as Will said, opening up that space for learning and practice of these skills that oftentimes there's oftentimes there's just a vacuum. There's a vacuum of nothing that is intervening in this space that is putting forward those positive messages in forms of, you know, skill building in a in a particular emotional skill building in a kind of way. And not surprising, I, the, the, the brilliant and thoughtful responses to that first question are they're compelling. They get the wheels really turning. So how does the harmful messaging surrounding masculinity inform violence and more specifically sexual violence? And then how does it impact men's ability to express their gender identity and sexual orientation? You know, when you talk about, um, you know, how these, how it plays out, I mean, you know, these, these, these negative notions are, um, they lend to to people having very short-sighted perspectives. Um, and then when those short-sighted perspectives are, are challenged, um, it creates anger, it creates, it creates bitterness, it creates a, um, a needing to feel like um, an enforcement of the way that I think is the right way and that the way that you're looking at it is the wrong way. And then that in, entails, that could look a lot of different ways. It could look in a heated discussion, it could look um, it could look like a, um, you know, a, a small group of people just feeling left alone. Um, oftentimes what it looks like is someone being uh, assaulted in certain cases uh, because their perspective is, is different um, than, than, others perspective, uh, than another's perspective. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard because, you know, what we talked about in the first question is that you have you have this historical narrative that's been written, right? And, um, and it's just been passed on and passed on and passed on. And then, you know, it just keeps continuously getting reinforced. And, you know, when it's challenged, it creates this, um, this kind of like a, a little bit of a hiccup. And people don't do well with change in general, particularly with men, you know, when you're talking about changing things, uh, men kind of like their, their regimented processes of, of things. And, um, and so when you have something that kind of jives against that, it's, it, um, it doesn't sit well. And so that creates a lot of tension and it creates a lot of, you know, um, you know, uncertainty. And, and then that uncertainty of not knowing what to do with it because it's bringing up feelings and it's bringing up emotions and oh my gosh you're talking about men and feelings and emotions oh that that's that's those are foreign words and so the only result I know how to do when I'm when I'm feeling like when I'm feeling unsure you know I'm not saying me but just an, a, a person who doesn't have that muscle like Jesse mentioned who hasn't developed that skill that muscle yet falls into that situation where they are going to respond negatively or respond poorly to to a situation. So it plays out in so many different ways and it's, it's very nuanced. It's not always so overt. It's, it's very nuanced into a lot of different, um, a lot of different pieces. Um, say, for example, I'll give you an example. You could play on a team, right? And one of your best friends on your team could be gay, okay? It could be a gay male, all right? Um, but the relationship you have with your teammate you may not want to let everybody else on the team know that you know that that person identifies differently than everybody else does. And so what happens is that the relationship between you and your, your teammate and, and who's your friend is strained because not everybody is going to be as accepting as you are 
And so that creates even that even that situation creates something because you can't be your authentic you can't have an authentic relationship because it's only it's only like a real solid relationship in pockets and in certain places and in certain venues, but it can't be um, an authentic relationship all the time because people may feel some type of way about that or they may judge you. So it's it's so, and that's why I just wanted to kind of give an example of the nuances because. And that's just that's just with us on the same team as 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 men, it just you know, just identifying differently. But it's it's just so it, it, there's so many so many pieces to it. But um, I think you know, without kind of going all over the place, I think that's really kind of where it's at. Is just it just shows up in so many places. But that's really kind of how it lends to the to the violence piece. So I want I want to I don't want to go too long. I want to give the, the the other guys an opportunity to speak on that. So. I, I'm, I'm also thinking about this from, we talk about generational trauma and other things. And I, and, you know, we are acknowledging that we don't allow men the space or there's this expectation that men won't talk about their emotions and thinking about how, um, like there's like typical roles of the provider, the savior, the protector, how those things come into play, especially if someone has experienced trauma and has to play those things out and, and how those things kind of get passed down as well. Um, and we think about how our parents before us and our grandparents and our great grandparents have gone through things. Um, and I know I have great grandparents that lived in London during World War II. And so I know that has impacted how my grandfather and my mother have existed in spaces. Um, because of lessons that are learned and that how that does that impact me and so I, I think also there needs to be space held for those things that are traumatic that we don't name as trauma um, and just put into well that's what boys do or that is the expectation of boys that reinforces those things because it also creates this barrier to accessing help to learn to grow and flex that um, emotional regulation muscle um, so I think some of this is, is in a way kind of like a generational trauma kind of thing in, in men are, are there to protect men are there to do everything and we legally prohibited women from participating in voting and working and owning credit cards and like, and that's recent history. So all the expectation to provide and do all these other things, um, that has to go somewhere, that has to turn into something that just doesn't dissipate. And if we've never given space for it to go somewhere, I think that becomes the general, that becomes the expectation of violence, that becomes the, I do all these things for you, why isn't it enough? And then resorting to violence for power and control because that is the only thing that has ever worked. And violence is a solution to a lot of problems. That's why we have violence in law enforcement. That's why we have, wars and things like that we use that to control other people to their behavior and i think those things um i may have gotten a little nebulous and meta level there but it, those things kind of roll into the expectation of how people will exist how people will behave i mean it was we didn't call it ptsd we called it shell shock and it was only for veterans of war and um we gave space and allowance to some of that but um we have spent generations not naming things as traumatic and, and forcing that into tiny boxes. And I think that is the gift and curse that has been passed down as well. One uh, personal experience, just to speak from that perspective to kind of, I think, bring it a couple, what my um, panelists just shared kind of down is, you know, growing up, um, you know, now I identify as bisexual, but when I was young person, I did not. Um, and I did not because it just didn't feel like an option when I was caught, you know, to, to will sort of point around if you're seen as too emotional or you care about how you dress or how you talk is more effeminate, any of these things, as was the case for me, then I would, I was constantly harassed and by some of my closest friends, you know, had anti-gay, you know, language and slurs just constantly in my direction and so it also it always felt like my belonging to groups and friendships was always dependent on my ability to prove myself, to prove that I was strong enough, to prove that 
I could get girlfriends to prove that I could have sex when I was younger to prove, I mean, whatever it might be that I was more dominant, that I was good at sports. If I wasn't doing those things, then it felt like my belong. And importantly, that if it didn't, if I wasn't using those same kinds of slurs back at other people, then I, my belonging would be uh, put into question. And, you know, and I think back on this, like I look at my, my yearbooks from when I was younger and like, I can't even look at the little, you know, people write in little pages with notes for your going to summer and stuff. And I mean, those slurs are in there too, you know, it's just, it was consistent. And um, mm. I remember that I wrote myself a, a letter when I was, uh, when I was uh, a freshman in high school, you know, 13, 14 years old. And one of there's like, there's circled in the middle of it. There was a piece that was like, am I gay? Like, I need to know the answer to this question at this time. And, uh, you know, tucked that away for four years, opened it at the end of high school. And a friend, um, a friend uh, when took a photo of it when I opened it and then posted on social media and was sort of like, you know, ha ha, Jesse was thinking about this, you know, all these kinds of things. And oftentimes people are kind of aghast, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did this. But I absolutely can believe you did that because, again, I think about some of the things that I did as well. And there is a, a culture that, again, your your belonging is is tied to being able to prove yourself or in particular to, to show that you are more funny, to put other men and boys down. And so I think that all of those pressures lead me to thinking about that in our in our work we need to create social permission to speak out against those things and to really intervene when we hear that kind of kind of the pressuring language that's really enforcing these rigid these rigid gender norms um and social permission to as we've just been talking about, be other kinds of boys and men, be be able to be more effeminate in these ways and be affirmed in that. Um, and to have mentors and to have parents and to have educators and to have policymakers speak directly to the breadth of who men and boys are. Because I think if we're not doing that, then we're still creating those those same boxes and we're not being as as open to the full breadth of experience that us as you know, men have. And I, and I love that you mentioned that, Jesse, <clears throat> because, you know, um, first of all, I just want to say, I'm sorry that you experienced that. I'm sorry that you experienced that. I'm sorry that I was probably one of those kids in school that um, wasn't as aware of myself as I needed to be and probably lended to those things. I mean, look, we got to call it what it is. Uh, we weren't always perfect. We're, <clears throat> we're all trying to get better. We're all trying to be better people, better professionals, um, and just better humans in general. And um, so I'm sorry that you experienced that. Um, and, you know, it, and it's hard because as you're, as you're think as you're talking about that, I'm thinking about as myself, I think about, you know, um, as I identify as a cisgender male, but, you know, I was raised by a woman, my mom raised me. So I'm very in, I'm very in tune with the experiences of women. So, <clears throat> you know, according to, you know, I, according to my friends, um, who probably see this, and, and it's funny, but I'm the I'm the sensitive one in the bunch. And you know why I'm the sensitive one? Because I think about people. Because I don't always want to do the crazy stuff. Because I'm always like I'm trying to, you know, to 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 offer a different perspective on things or what have you. And you know that's kind of way I've always been my life. Now I like I said I identify as a cisgender male, but you know, even that gets challenged when you're, you, you, you feel the pressure as a man to fall in line with the gender norms, the norms of, oh, we probably shouldn't be doing this, but you know what, if I say something about this, then I'm going to be looked at differently. So, you know what, I'm just going to go along with this because this is what everybody needs to do. And I don't want, I don't want to catch any flack for it. And I think that however you identify in our, in our, in just in the male gender that's just such a major major issue is that we don't i think jesse who, who said that i think jesse you said permission right we don't have permission to do those sorts of things we don't have permission to be to go against to go against the grain um going against the grain um however you identify is always something where you're gonna have to count the cost and say okay 
I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm probably going to catch some flack for it, but it's going to be what it's going to be. And I think that more times, um, not then, then more times than not, we, 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 we find ourselves caving in and being willing to just go with the flow rather than feeling like we have that opportunity or that space to say something different, you know, to be different. Because just as Jesse was saying, some of his close friends are throwing those slurs. You know, um, I think about how maybe some teammates didn't want to say those things to Jesse, but had to say those, felt like they were, they had to say those things because this is what everybody else is doing. And I don't want to be looked at as like, oh, I'm in love with Jesse because I'm, because I'm defending, you know, it's just, and I, and Jesse, I'm not using just, you, cause you mentioned, so I'm using your example, but uh, there's, there's kids experiencing this all over the country right now, you know, every day they're experiencing this same sort of thing. Um, and so it's, it's just one of those things that, um, that it's, 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 it's tough because the notions around it are just so rigid. And I just keep going back to this word permission. There's no space, there's no permission to be able to do anything different than um, what it dictates. So really appreciate all of that. Um, and, and there's so many layers here talking about privilege, talking about harm, talking about complicit, complicity, um, where, where we are complicit as men. And if we are feeling boxed in and having to perform our gender of masculinity uh, that we have are often asked to or for our male membership card required to cause harm to others. Um, and uh, that importance of kind of being mindful about not drawing false equivalencies, as much harm as we might experience if we stepped outside and didn't engage in that harmful behavior, the harm that is then being inflicted upon others is, is significant and it's not quite the same, right? Um, so I just wanted to move forward with that acknowledgement too, um, that Jesse, what you experienced as, as harm and what anyone else who either steps outside or, or the expectation men have to cast harm against women uh, in various forms, um, that the cost that would be incurred by us for bucking against that norm and that expectation would not be the same. And, and as a white man, a white cisgender man in a heterosexual marriage um, who's English speaking and is employed and the layers of privilege afforded me, if I deviate from those norms, I still retain and carry with me a ton of privilege. Um, so how do we engage in communities for whom hostile, hostile masculinity may exist as a defense mechanism in light of or in response to oppressive societies um, while being mindful of, if you're asking somebody who already doesn't walk through society with a lot of privilege to now deviate from the stereotype of what it means to be masculine and, and perhaps put aside some of that male privilege, how do we engage effectively with communities who have to navigate those challenges in ways that may be different from what we bring to the table as, as advocates in this work, as, um, as folks who have these conversations all the time? Well, I'll go again if you want me to, <laughs> uh, because this piece is this this piece is where it's, it's where it's at. Jesse and I have had numerous conversations about community, and I think the first thing. So let let's just let's just put this first, okay? Because this is because this is where it just has to be. We have to understand the way the systems work, and systems are oppressive in them in and of themselves, okay? So systems, you know, are the if you will are the holders of these. And, and supporters sometimes of these rigid notions that we have about the way that we operate in this world. And I think that, you know, if we're really gonna do this work, there has to be a paradigm shift. We have to, we have to really put this work in the hands of the community. Um, systems, you know, do analytics um, and, you know, they, they, they go in and they, they do all this data and research and I'm not against data, I'm not against research, it's necessary, but, People are not numbers. People are human beings. People have feelings. People have emotions. People have, um, you know, intersections in their lives that need to be addressed. And a lot of times, the way that we handle communities is through the lens of those analytics and through the lens of those numbers, and it's not very personable. And so, if we're going to really make change, if we're really, really going to make change, we have to we have to get down to the roots and really get in communities and allow communities to speak to us, to inform us of what they need. Um, particularly, you know, having sessions where 
we are engaging with uh, with young men, finding out what the challenges are that they face, not just assuming, because you know, none of us on this on this call may want to admit this, but we're the old we're the older guys now. We're you know we're not as informed as we'd like to be, as cool as we may think we are. We're not as informed as we'd like to be. I know Jeff's like, come on, will you speak for yourself? But uh, <laughs> but I mean seriously, I mean the dynamics and challenges that we face growing up are not the same dynamics and challenges that our youth are facing today. So I just use the youth as one example, but listening to them, finding out what, what, are, what are their challenges and then tailoring our services and tailoring our conversations and tailoring what we need. I think that's a lot of what Jesse does um, you know, in his work is, is doing that, is showing up in communities and really engaging in that way. And so you know, he and I have partnered together to do a lot of work in our state you know, with that same effort to try to try to really get to the to the root and, and not do it from a perspective of, you know, this 15,000 foot view of things. No, we, we need to get right into communities and be hand in hand and be vulnerable. I love that Jesse shared about his own lived experience because it's a level of vulnerability. He's on a national stage right now sharing this and it's okay because that's what we need to do. We can't, we can't show up as perfect. I think Jeff you know, mentioned this as you know, this whole perfectionism, which is a, which is a form of, which is a, uh, a covenant or a, um, a, a, uh, a tenant of white supremacy is this perfectionism idea. And we are not perfect people. We all, we're all falling short and we need to show up in our full selves to really be able to grab the hands of those and walk with them together and not just pushing them along, but walking together saying, I'm failing in life, I'm challenged in life, just as well as you two, how are we going to get past this? And how are we going to do something different together? So sorry, I kind of went on a little bit there. But that's this is this is where my heart is right now, because I just feel like our world just needs that. You know, I, I think if anything, we've learned through COVID, I think that we've learned that our systems don't work as well as we think they do. And we need to get back. And I think that sometimes we have this, um, this, this idea that we need to come up with this um, elaborate, innovative way of doing something. No, it's actually pretty simple. Seeing people as people, you know, seeing people as people and meeting people where they're at. It's just that simple. That, um, that last piece, I have two, three thoughts, but that last piece, always with, with curriculum writing and things like that, they want something new and innovative. How about we just step back and just meet people where they're at first? I, I think we get too much in what is fancy, what is new, and, and how do we talk to youth? You sit down and you have a conversation, which leads me to the other point of and my answer is, um, we also need to give people permission to grieve the things that they don't like and, and help them name what they've lost or they think they've lost and help them grieve that and give them a, that permission to be something else, but also say, I will stand with you as you grow into this new thing. You are not doing this alone. Because I think that's the other major issue is the isolation that, that the other panels have both mentioned that comes with this. And also, so like I am a queer non-binary person with some in invisible disabilities, and that shows up in different ways for me as well. And so it's also naming that each person is going to need to experience and grow in a different way. And it's not about creating rigid path still, like in curriculum and things like that, it's not pre-test, post-test. Okay, did you learn the difference? How, what is, what is the social emotional learning? How are we creating new pathways that are not rigid? Because if we continue to maintain the same ideas of like, we're gonna teach them new skills, but it's still based in the previous framework we will actually change now. Curriculum, let's take the, let's talk about curriculum. Okay, and Jesse and I have had this conversation. Yes, there needs to be structure, right? There needs to, everything needs to be done in decency and order. I, I, I firmly, firmly agree with that. But when curriculums are created, are we, are we taking into consideration who we're talking to and the learning styles and, and the attention spans of people? Are we, are we doing that? I think once again, showing up with a curriculum, hey, we got a curriculum, let's go into the community and let's do this. Or are you thinking about the reading levels and the educational levels of some of the folks that you're going in and talk to? Do you have a skilled facilitator who's able to switch it up and be dynamic and, and bring it and bring it down and present it in a way where people are going to be able to engage? 
I think that that's one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges when we're talking about this idea of masculinity and trying to introduce something new is that coming back for a second and realizing that this has been around for a long period of time and it's going to be a slow rollout process but you have to take advantage of pockets of people who are willing to listen and really grow and cultivate those pockets of people and then as you grow and cultivate those pockets of people who are willing to listen and willing to to take a stand against gender-based violence and, and say, you know, I, I know I can do more as a male. I know I can step up. I know that I need some education around some different things and ways of, of dealing, you know, with my own stuff and unpacking my own stuff. Once you've cultivated them, then what you're doing is you're raising leaders. You're raising other men who then carry the message onto another small, small pocket of people. And then it grows that way. I think sometimes we want to, we want to do things whole shot. We want to to show up and we want to just make a big splash. I like big splashes, but is it realistic when you're talking about change work? Not very much, not very much. It, it's a slow process where you have to be very intentional about who you engage with and how you engage with them. And then that's how it gets going. And, and so you're creating this, this consistency of, of messaging that, that is going to be supported. I think about a, there was a youth organizer in the, um, Boston area where I used to live before being in California, who uh, lost a friend to gun violence. And I remember seeing him because it brought Jeff when you said the word grieve, you know, I remember seeing him just in so much pain. Um, and it was really hard to know how to support him. And honestly, I think myself, I supervised him. So there's a professional relationship that we had. But also, as someone who is white with a young black man, I have not lost a close friend to gun violence in the way that he had in that moment. I don't think I was the right person for him to really get that kind of support uh, from and the kind of relationship. But it made me think about, again, in our in our programming, our work, like going back to the, the healthy masculinity conversation, the skills piece, how are we supporting young people to have the skills to support one another? so that his friends in that situation could play that role where he has the space to feel cared for, where he doesn't need to tuck it away. He doesn't need to act strong. He can struggle on the basketball court for a while and have that be okay and know that he's not going to have people dig him out. Like, that's where I think that our approaches, I mean, we practically, what does it mean to meet people where they're at? I think it means knowing, you know, how do people, being conscious of representation, being conscious of, um, you know, who, who is most appropriate to be a messenger for things and just really empowering community, as Will said, to um, to put those lessons forward. But I think that, that that peer support piece, I think, is a great example of just making sure that, you know, we're really empowering everyone to play that. It's like it's just knitting together that community uh, piece, I guess, as Will said. That maybe is not the best put, but I think that example still kind of speaks to the question. And building off of that, um, as we think about the, the the folks that we are seeking to engage in this work, as we are engaging with, with other men out in communities, uh, it's important to consider that men, boys, youth that we're, we're working with have experienced trauma and maybe mm -hmm. survivors themselves of, of sexual violence. They may be survivors themselves of domestic violence. They may have grown up in a household where they witnessed violence. Um, so why is it important for us as a, as a movement, which often doesn't do a great job stepping outside of a binary construct and, and envisioning men as they can both be a gender that represents um, very problematic behavior, but they may also be survivors themselves. Um, so why is it important to talk about the needs of survivors who are male? Uh, how can we improve access to services for male identified survivors? Um, specifically, men from most marginalized communities, men of color, men who are trans, um, men who are immigrants, men. How do, we, how do we work as a movement to do better to meet the needs of these survivors? I'm not going to, I, I'm not an expert in, um, you know, I'm not a trained counselor, for example. Um, I don't run a shelter. Uh, I'm not an expert in victim services. So I'm not going to sort of go down what I think a lot of this looks like in practice, because I think that that's so important. And I think that there, 
is growing work. I think about, you know, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center that, you know, last year and forthcoming putting out a lot of materials and tools and training around this for, um, for domestic violence and sexual assault agencies, which I think is fantastic. But I mean, I'll just say quickly that why is it important to meet the, the needs to recognize the male survivorship? I think it's because we're, we're people, you know, we're people who deserve, deserve care, who deserve to be seen holistically. We talk about these other forms of trauma and abuse that might be there you know, in, in childhood. And I also think that more from an educational point of view, I think that so often there is a framing that again, pins men solely as perpetrators and solely as not just perpetrators, but men do things unto others and onto the world. And this is true to some extent. There's a degree of that socialized kind of dominance, need to be strong, controlling, all of these things. But until we change the framing that men are also receivers, are those who can be impacted, not just those who do impacting on the world around us. I think that that framing is really important so that we can, again, meet meet boys and men where we're at. And I think that until we, as you said, you know, Robert, recognize the ways in which, you know, we know that those who have witnessed domestic violence growing up, for example, are so much more likely to have that be something in their life later or to use um, violence in a relationship. So just on a very strategic and practical purpose, if we're not looking at this, we're not, we're not doing, we're not going to be effective. We're not going to actually create change because we're not actually recognizing that this is about cyclical violence. I mean, we could get into a whole conversation around incarceration and around the mm -hmm. prison system and how we don't have restorative practices and our system, that's kind of what you were getting at, Will, of like our systems are not set up to have there be anything besides punishment. And that's difficult because we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that are needed. I mean, more than that nationally to really be doing this. And of course, statewide, it's, you know, anyways, again, I'm not an expert around kind of incarceration and, and kind of doing work within prison systems, but that's very much a part of this conversation as well. So again, I think if we're not looking at this we're not going to be effective and it's not effective because we're not seeing men as people. I'd say, I mean, it's in some level, it's prevention work because this, this is cyclical. If someone is raised, always being afraid in their life, they're always like, and they develop PTSD, they're always going to be ready for a fight. Um, you know, I have friends that, you know, go to me because they like want to release the Jeffrey because I'm, you know, tag me and I got you. But how is that helpful to me? And so, yes, I'm a survivor in that moment, um, or I am a survivor in every moment, I should say. It, but how does that impact the way we exist? Because we also exist in community. Trauma is a community in an injury as well. Because if we don't heal that, that will keep bleeding on to other people. And that's not necessarily... And this is not to excuse behaviors or, or justify in any way, any harm that has continued to be perpetuated. But it is also that person has been withheld from learning skills to do differently, to learn better, because they are also deserving of them. They are deserving of compassion. They are deserving of love. And when we don't support or, or, or support them and we only see this punitive system, we then also become afraid of accountability. Right. And so if we go with this script that men do unto others, which is largely true. Um, and and that from there, if we are making accountability look like incarceration or death, um, because we've called for help and it was escalated, we stop accessing those systems. And so we continue to let those wounds fester within the community. So Part of healing this and preventing violence in other places is giving space to those people that men, mask folks, that we don't allow space to, to heal those things. Um, because that, as we heal ourselves, we heal each other. And as we heal each other, we, we heal ourselves. Um, and I think that's creating that, that dynamic within our community is incredibly important as um, 
a prevention tool, if nothing else. You know, I worked with men who've caused harm. <clears throat> I did that solely for 15 years. Um, and I've worked with, um, dare I say, thousands of men um, who were, um, some were in a community corrections program, some were paroled to the street, some were on probation, some were referrals from uh, what was then um, uh, DIFUS, now DCPMP, um, you know, uh, family court, what have you. So uh, an array of referral sources um, would provide, um, you know, participants for, you know, for our groups. And um, the largest population of individuals we had were our Department of Corrections individuals who were in the halfway houses that the organization that we worked with ran. So you'd meet with individuals, you know, you meet with these guys and they would come in and, you know, they would, um, they would have these lengthy jackets. Um, when I say jacket, meaning um, the prison jackets uh, for different charges or circumstances or what have you. And so you conduct these interviews and, you know, you find out that, and, I, and this is unofficial. So, um, but I would say 90 in the high 90 percentile, I would say, of the men that I have met that qualified to uh, for the service were either victims or witnesses of abuse. Okay, um, and I'll say that again: that in the high ninety percent, these these men were either victims or witnesses of abuse. So you have the the traumas that that each one of that Jesse and and Jeff were talking about. You have the traumas that that these these men have been walking around with. And it's manifested itself in their lives in some way, shape, or form. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that our society is very unforgiving, very unforgiving. You do something wrong, you're going to pay for it, and this is what it is. Um, you know, very few people are asking why or even care about why. And, and so I am not, um, you know, I have to be very careful. And I've said this over the years, it's like, you know, doing batters intervention work, you know, I don't want it to be like, oh, well, Will's drank the Kool-Aid. Now he's, now he's, now he's jaded and he's on this. No, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm on humanity's side. That's what I'm, that's the side that I'm on. I'm on humanity's side. And everyone has the right to heal. Everyone has a right to heal. Everyone has the right to have an opportunity to have access to services. and. Um, and to find freedom from the from the traumas that they faced in their lives, but you have to do some 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 real culture shifting. Um, you know, particularly I can only speak as a black male because that's what I am. Um, our community does not we're not raised to go to counseling. We're not raised to talk about the problems that we faced in our lives. We're not raised to do that. There is trauma that we face every day. Depending on you know, I'm grateful to have lived in a in a, in a little better neighborhood you know, where, and I went to better schools, but I have friends that, you know, walked past gang violence every day on their way to school to, and, you know, to and from, and that, you know, they had that pressure of, of facing that or some sort of, uh, you know, lived in neighborhoods where there were, you know, constant, you know, gunshots and, 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 and um, homicides where the death of, of friends was just a very commonplace thing. I, you know, I grew up with friends that that was their lives but you're not taught to speak about it. And those things are often are often overlooked as just commonplace. Oh, that's just where they live. But never mind the emotional and, and, uh, and mental trauma that these individuals who live in that daily become desensitized and face, which is just a norm for them. But nonetheless, it's, it's as equally or as more traumatic. And so if we're not raising cultures and generations of men that know how to talk about things, um, then how are trauma, if you ask the word trauma to the average man, this is how, you know, unfamiliar we are. If you ask the word trauma to, to the average man, they're going to think it's resulting, involving some sort of car accident or something along the lines of that. They have no association with the fact that, um, I'll just use a, a general example, you seeing your friend you know, on the basketball court on Tuesday and then waking up Wednesday morning and him being dead is a traumatic situation, but there's no association to that. I just lost a friend. It is what it is. And I keep moving on. 
you know, and that's the that's the burden of trauma that a lot of a lot of men in marginalized communities are living with. And, um, and so once again, you know, we, the, the, there's not a lot of there's there's no education around that because it's just not a community norm. Um, and once again, I, I, I could go into more because, you know, Jesse, I mentioned about the incarceration piece and, and that whole system, that structure, that system. There's a lot of men in incarcerated that have mental health issues that are undiagnosed, that are continuing to perpetuate violence in their lives, but they're being seen as bad people, and they really have, you know, um, they really have a, uh, a should be diagnosed with some sort of disorder, um, but they don't know how to express themselves enough or have access to the services besides being in a correctional facility um, to get the help that they need. So. Um, you know, going back to what I originally said, I think there needs to be a large systemic change. You know, we, we have to do a lot of systems changing. One thing that our systems do, and, and that could be argued that they work very well at what they're intended to do, which is sometimes perpetuate more harm. Um, and our systems do criminalize trauma and responses to trauma. Um, they, they don't provide uh, resources for mental health care, substance use care, but then they, they have police respond to psychiatric crises. They um, criminalize substance use. Um, there's, they, they lock people up in a punitive system that in, inflicts even greater harm and trauma. And then upon release, chalk it up as recidivism if somebody does engage, continue to engage in these, these behaviors that they never had a chance to unlearn and not just unlearn, but then learn new behaviors that are less harmful. So this conversation has covered the range of response, prevention, intervention. Um, and I wanted to ask that as men, we, we do carry, regardless of other identities that are layered on top of our male identity. Um, but as folks who identify as mask, who identify as male, we are afforded male privilege in our society. Uh, all those systems that we've spoken about, they interface with us as men very differently than they do for folks with other gender identities. So how do we leverage our male privilege? How do we advise others who are watching this on how they can utilize their male privilege in a way that is addressing harm, preventing violence, and holding ourselves accountable for the times in which we are complicit in harm? So some quick thoughts on that. Um, I would lead with don't fear accountability. Um, and, and so it, and it is a scary, terrifying thing. Um, modeling the behavior that we're trying to get from others is, is probably the easiest and also most difficult thing to do. I think um, stepping in and, and interceding, intervening in instances where you're observing something harmful happening um, is important. I think that we can also, as we say, start by believing when someone tells you something is happening, you believe them. Um, taking that back to accountability, if someone's telling you your behavior is harmful, that is important. And it's also important to, that one behavior is a behavior, not necessarily a reflection of yourself, right? And so learning like a dialectical framework of separating those two things, um, but allowing, yourself and like doing the work for yourself and modeling it for everyone else is a way that we can start doing this. I remember learning about a, a framework of, um, and I'm not going to remember who to attribute it to right now, but uh, in thinking about positive social change uh, work, you know, the difference of, of thinking around rights versus responsibility. So the idea of human rights, the idea that everyone has rights that shouldn't be crossed. Um, you know, that when thinking about pay equity, you know, okay, well, there's a right to equal pay. And what I think that it misses is the, this piece of, well, what is each of our roles in this? So to your point of what us as men can do, um, the response, what does it mean to create a sense of responsibility amongst men that this is our issue, that gender equity, pay equity, that violence and abuse are our issues to deal with primarily is, I think, so different. You know, Will said, if you bring up the question of trauma, a lot of people aren't even recognizing it. It's the, it's the same kind of thing is if we're not creating a sense of emotional attunement 
and literacy and vocabulary, if we're not creating that and we're not pairing that with what does it mean for us to be responsible for our community, for the safety and the well-being of our community, of our peers, of our workplaces, I think that we're not going to, that's just big picture. I think when I think about the role that the men have is what can we do? And so I think what's so important is that, and I think that we're missing a, a, a structure. I was just talking about this yesterday. I think we're missing a structured pipeline that ways that men from all walks of life, whether or not you are in schools, higher ed, athletics and sports if you work you know you're a, you're a manager at a company you run a business you are in the medical field you're in the mental health and counseling field every single one of those domains we can as men be advocating for positive change we can i mentioned pay equity as an example if i'm a manager am i doing things around pay transparency am i creating a healthy work environment and do, do i know how to support someone who does have a um a, a situation where they're in a, a domestic violence um, within a relationship um there's of course I, I think other pieces around how if i'm an educator having conversations with the young men that i teach if I'm a coach, how am I having weekly conversations about these kinds of topics and using teachable moments if some of that harmful language is used? I mean, every single one of us has a role, no matter what our professional or our personal lives look like. And I think that's where it's saying we need to offer clear opportunities and ways for men to take action, no matter where we are. And I think we're missing that as a whole field. I think we're missing ways in which we are creating clear and structured training opportunities, resources. I mean, even to make it so that you can get continuing education credits and things to really make it so that these things can be worthwhile for you. And it's not just an extra training that's being lumped onto what, you're, what you already have in your day-to-day -day life. So I think we're missing that. And I think we need to work towards the ability to, I think there are some resources, there's so many videos out there, there's curricula out there, but um, I think we need a better way to be able to say all of us can be activated to make change. And I think um, we're missing some of that, honestly. You are, you, you're, we're connected um, in life um, through all of those channels that Jesse had mentioned, um, through whether you run a business, you are um, a coworker, um, whatever capacity you're in, you have an opportunity and the privilege to be able to affect change. And again, not to be redundant, but I think that sometimes we're waiting for this big bang or this like, you know, this cataclysmic event in this perfect scenario in order to really say something, but it's just stepping up when you hear a conversation where there's language that shouldn't be used to uh, to um, to describe another another coworker, another male coworker, or um, language to to describe a, a woman, uh, whether it be in your barbershop, whether it be in your supermarket, whether it be at the at the at the dinner table, whether it be at you know we're rolling around holiday time. I can't believe we're saying holiday time, but before we know it, Thanksgiving will be here, and it's like you know our families sometimes. Are, are our greatest opportunity to really affect change because some of this stuff is really steeped in our families. And then we will look around and we wonder where we got it from. And so I think that sometimes it's just as simple as stepping up and saying something right where you're at, taking the opportunities that you have to affect change from right where your position is. Um, yes, you can go looking for them, but I think that that's where the real change begins. If you are if you have children, if you are, um, you know, in, you know, an, an influencer in, you know, in different, in different circles, um, you know, you have the, you have the opportunity to use your voice. And so I, I just would say not discrediting what my other uh, partners have said, but I just would say, you don't need to find this perfect uh, scenario just step up, get involved and do something, help someone. And, um, you know, we had our survivor panel at our conference and um, one of the survivors, Lex, they said, 
Um, if you're not the one, find the one. Meaning that if you can't offer the help or, or the services that, that need to be, or you're not the voice that needs to, be, needs to speak into that situation, then find the voice that needs to speak into that situation and help, and help where you can. Well, this has been an outstanding conversation. Again, not surprising, uh, but I genuinely appreciate the, the candid conversation, the authenticity, the vulnerability. Uh, often, as we have this conversation, traits that are not always valued among those who identify as, as masculine. So thank you for modeling those traits. Thank you for modeling the, the inherent strength that can be manifest from from bringing that your, your true selves forward and your full selves, your holistic beings forward, um, because that is how we can be good allies. That is how we can be willing to listen and follow the lead of those that we are seeking to be allies to. Um, and I, I feel this has been a great demonstration of that. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to, to those in the audience who have uh, humored four men waxing poetic <laughs> about gender-based violence. Um, and we welcome feedback and comments uh, as, as we move forward with the, the next portion of this conference. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, um, first of all, to everyone for joining us for day two of our conference, and thanks to our panelists for kicking off day two with such great conversation. Um, welcome to all of you. Special thanks to Jesse, because I know it's super early where you are, so we appreciate <laughs> you being a trooper. Um, and let's just get right to the questions. So the first question is, the comments about needing systems change made me think about discussions to make restorative justice an option. Restorative justice is often brought up in terms of supporting survivors, but do you think the option of restorative justice would also help break down the culture of violence that is impacted by ideas of masculinity? And I open that to whoever wants to jump in first. I do have some ideas. Hi, this is uh, Jeff or Jeffrey Anthony, and I'm joined by my cat Menlo. Um, just an image description of me. I'm a white mask presenting guy. I'm wearing a orange beanie and a gray sweater, and I'm joined by my 15 year old orange tabby. Um, and so to answer the question about restorative justice, right, and so also thinking about that as coming from an indigenous practice and trying to implement it into a system that is punitive, because I know that was a thing we were you know, talking about. Justice also needs to be proactive and preventative. And so if we're going to do that, I think that's fantastic, but it needs to be um, already existing and incorporated into everything we do to show that we are are caring because if it's a if it's like accessibility and everyone is doing it oh let's get something real quick let's get an asl interpreter and we forgot about it at the end of the event like we can tell those of us who are impacted by this um you know because we talked about multiple identities in there and i'm a you know i am a mad person i'm a person with multiple um intellectual or developmental disabilities um autism and adhd PTSD, like I exist in all those systems, right? And so part of restorative justice and, and being proactive in these things is recognizing that we come into this with multiple identities and multiple experiences. So for like organizations, if you want to talk about how we're all about restorative justice and about centering um, these things, we also have to acknowledge that um, men, because I also read the next question about how we are, you know, statistically the ones more likely to perpetrate, but also that we've been perpetrated against in, in those things. We walk with our jagged edges, those of us who are self-aware, um, right? Trying our best to not harm. And because it is, we're invariably going to harm, but that's also because it's a feedback system with the, the systems we have. So restorative justice has to come up front. You can't prioritize your uh, chief development officer at $125,000 a year, and then what your queer community lay liaison to be paid $55,000 a year, especially because what you're marketing is my queerness, for example, right? And so if we want to have restorative justice, I need to see that you have equity in how you're paying people because a lot of people just got me, like me, just got killed. They were shot up for being gay, right? Um, and so we exist in those multiple things, but you want us to be 
your queer representative to say you're a good organization, you know what you're doing, but I, I don't see it. So I do think restorative justice is great, but I think where we are at as a profession and as a community is not nearly anywhere self-aware enough to implement that in a meaningful way because we're creating this binary system of the people doing the work and the people that we're supporting without realizing that there's this third entity of this system that's articulating this in, in the first place. Um, so I think it can be really helpful, but I think there's more work to be done first. Thank you. Jesse and Will? You want to go first of all? Oh, I'll let you go. I'll yield to you. Um, I think that the the there's two aspects of restorative justice that need to be distinguished from each other, because I think on one side is restorative justice that is focused upon reparation once kind of harm has occurred, more from the standpoint of intervention and how is someone learning um, and taking accountability for their actions or harm or abuse that they've caused. And absolutely, and, and, and Will has the most, I think, experience in, in that domain in thinking about getting into trauma and breaking down those cycles and treating people with dignity and respect throughout that process and believing that people can change. I also think that there's another element of restorative justice that can be more interwoven into our general kind of education and prevention practices in thinking about Again, offering space, not necessarily once a, a grand form of abuse has occurred, but nevertheless, how are we supporting young people and young men to understand when they have caused harm or used harmful language or, or, um, or been kind of complicit or not said anything when their friends have been, you know, using homophobic language to others or have been um, you know, have been catcalling. So there's sort of those micro forms of how are we supporting young men to, to, to ask deep questions about why? Like, why are these things okay? Where do these things come from in us from the standpoint of wanting to be seen or recognized by peers? I think we spoke a lot about that. Um, and so I think the restorative justice kind of principle there, again, is less once um, a major form is, of harm has occurred individually, um, between or between two individuals, and more so um, as as a principle of reflection, as a principle of accountability, um, and absolutely as the question alluded to, um, as a principle of understanding where ideas of masculinity come from in the first place. Um, thank you, Jesse, and uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm just going to echo the sentiments uh, of my of my fellow panelists. Um, I think that, um, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna restate. I'll just, um, I'll just uh, support the, the ideas. Um, I'll say just for the sake of time um, that we need to start early with our, with our youth. We need to, there, there needs to be a better effort. Um, and this is no, uh, this is no shade against educational systems because we all know that just to provide the basics is, is a, is a burden for, for school systems, so completely understand that. But um, I've had this conversation many times with about the uh, the amount of time a student spends in the in the classroom or in the school setting versus what they spend at home, and so we so we know that that's their that's the largest um, opportunity for exposure to things, and so we need to I feel as though we need to do a better job um, at providing. Um, if we can provide AP calculus and AP history and all these advanced uh, courses, then we need to pr pr provide an AP, you know, healthy relationships course on uh, on life. We need to provide that as well too. Um, and then this is no this is no uh, no secret about myself. Um, I feel as though we need to give men who caused harm an opportunity to to heal as well too. Um, there needs to be uh, resources and education. Um, it's not that we're not survivor centered. Um, I think we are very much survivor centered by 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 helping to focus on um, or helping to address the issues that men who cause harm uh, have and helping them find healing so that the so the behavior is not repeated. So I'll just leave that there. Thank you. 
So we're going to move on to our next question. The next question is violence prevention must address men because it is largely men who perpetrate this type of violence. But what would you say are the first steps in addressing boys and men? When and how do we get the conversation started? How do we engage men to do the work to prevent sexual violence? And how do you bring these principles and practices to your own work? There are when when to get started and how is that applied? I feel like there's it's 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 every moment I mean, young people, children take up these messages from when they are, I mean, in the crib, um, you know, and and are seeing what's what's around them at home and then are seeing what's around them in kindergarten, and so on and so forth. And so I think that the the principles are applied to, you know, again, just I, there's so many pieces that we spoke about, about affirming, affirming particularly young men's um, and intervening when well, affirming young men's experiences, emotions, building, um, you know, asking questions to really dive into those pieces, intervening if there are moments where we see the policing of gender norms starting at a young age. If we see pieces that are saying, oh, that's not what it means to be a boy, that's not what it means to be a girl, being able to have com candid conversations in those moments at a young age, I think is very, um, is very important. Um, and then, it, you know, well brought up too, you think about, you know, in, in schools, like how are teachers being prepared? I think about my, my friend who is a middle school teacher and she um, was doing some restorative justice sort of circles and various kinds of things in, in her middle school here. And there were a number of boys that I think were really seeking mentorship and were seeking um, accountability and mentorship all, all kind of rolled into one and care. And there was just a vacuum of men at the school who, even if they wanted to do something, they didn't know, well, how do I have the conversation with young with young male students. And I think that that was a good representation of how, you know, as much as we as organizations, schools, agencies can provide opportunities for men from, again, so many walks of life, fathers, young people, teachers, em empl employers to learn about the risk, what, what it looks like in practice, I think, um, I think the better. Yeah, I love that intergenerational approach. Um, we are unfortunately out of time, but I did want to give Jeff and Will um, a, at least a brief moment if you want to add anything to what Jesse just shared in response to that question. Go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say, um, this may not be easy, but let's not start with approaching that young boys and men will be perpetrators, give them an opportunity to have a different outcome, right? If you wanna do restorative justice, lead with, there are other options to, to Will's point about relationship class. Let's add, how do we actually deal with conflict? And I think Jesse got into this as well is, we don't, and, and I've been a sex educator for 15 years, we don't actually teach how to handle conflict. We don't teach how to resolve conflict. We don't teach accountability. Um, and that's not just a men and young boys thing that is an interconnected because we exist in community. So that is a thing for all of us to learn because, you know, I have a colleague on this call um, from a previous organization that I worked on who was brilliant and, and, you know, talking about gender based violence, but not being able to co present as representing two different genders right and showing how we can exist in community and communicate and healthy. We need to make sure that we have standards that. Um, are reinforcing it. I, I facilitated an online class for a university. They have a certificate in supporting survivors and things, which I think is problematic in and of itself because you pay for it and you you always pass, right? So what other systems are we creating? Who are we saying is qualified to support and do these things? And and you know, in the conversation, I forget it was either just your will, like we don't fund this in a way that's meaningful. Um so you're also getting facilitators, educators, and things that are at their limit and burnt out, which comes across to the young people. So 
So this is also a much bigger systems issue. And I think part of the problem is we hyper-focus on specific variables because of years of the CDC telling us we need to pre-test and post-test. So we only know how to have very myopic focuses on certain things. And I think we need to step back and look at how all of these things integrate and interact. And I think that's the root behind like DEI is the idea of like, no, there's actually people involved. This isn't just a statistic. This is another thing to be certified in. This is not more jargon. There is real work. And then there's the performative stuff that we do to make ourselves look good. Um, and so that's my rapid thought. Thanks, Jeff. Will? Um, I'll be very brief. I just want to say, start where you're at. Take advantage of opportunities to engage. Um, it, it, it's really and, and I don't mean to be redundant um, uh, from the from the from the pre-recorded video. Um, I just want to, I guess, I just want to re-emphasize the fact of that. You know, um, start where you're at. Um, take advantage of opportunities. Uh, we all have folks in our lives that we can um, that we can speak into their lives about different situations. And um, I do like the point of not uh, assuming that men are going to be perpetrators, but I just think that. There's enough um, messaging that comes through our social media, through our uh, televisions, um, through channels, uh, period, that, um, that sitting down with people, these particularly young folks in your lives and having conversations around those things is really um, a good start. It's a good place. Um, being able to refute some of the messaging that's coming through and, um, and speaking, you know, and, and speaking to speaking truth and seeing how they're processing it and allowing them to have uh, a voice in the space. Uh, I think one, uh, a lot of times what happens with our young folks is that they don't feel heard. They don't feel that they have um, the opportunity to, to, to be heard or that their opinions are valued. And I think that that's, that's an important step when we're talking about engaging our youth um, and really uh, creating change. So thank you, I'll just end there. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you.